Okay, thank you for time. So, my talk is on digital forensics. So if I said to you the word forensics, what comes into your mind straight away? Often, it's this, a white lab coat. Now, I do digital forensics, and often when I tell people that, they'll think, okay, there's a guy or girl in a white lab coat sitting in a big, clean room with no windows, no clean air, no direct sunlight, with lots of computers tinkering around for 15 to 20 hours a day. That's about right, but we don't wear a lab coat. So when, when people ask me what I do, and I say I'm a digital forensic investigator, I get this look. Interesting. <laughs> now that's because they're either wondering, what the hell is the digital forensic investigator? So hopefully I give you a bit of insight of what, what I do, and, and people around there as consultants in digital forensics, what they get about doing. So there's a few buzzwords out there that people know us as, so digital forensics, cyber forensics, computer forensics, digital cyber computer forensics, you name it, it's out there. So for those who don't know what digital forensics is, there's a simple way to describe it. It's the collection, it's the analysis, and the reporting of various types of electronic data that can be preserved in a way to be presented in a court of law. Now, we use various forensic tools to do that, and the reason why I've got a, a fingerprint here is that the tools capture it in a way that preserves this data, and what's called metadata, which is actually data about data. Let's say, for example, you have a Word document, the author date, the, the creation date, the modified date, all these things are very important in terms of investigation. So it, what it does is it hashes the file and creates a digital fingerprint. So later on, when we're looking at copies of these files, we can actually relate it back to the source if it goes to court. Now, the work we often do is done covertly. That means unsuspecting individuals in offices, when they come up to their business day at their desk, hopefully your desk doesn't look like that, you would have not have known that we've actually collected your data from this machine. So what we do, usually, we come late at night into offices, sometimes like this. Firstly, we have to spot where the electronic evidence is. So if you can see clearly, there's, there's a, a machine there somewhere in the pile of mess. What we have to do is take digital pictures because we have to replace everything as it's seen after we collect the evidence. Because if you come up to your workspace or your desk the next morning and find out that your mouse is on the left-hand side when you're a right-hander, there's something wrong, right? The other type of work we do is overtly. So we'll often go in with legal counsel or the police to do an investigation. Now, as, as John mentioned, this show has a lot to be said for, for forensics and digital forensic world. It's great, it's really put to the forefront over the past few years what digital forensics is all about. What it's done badly is, as Steven sort of touched on before, is that you can just wave your hands over a keyboard and all of a sudden, the solve my problem key comes up. Unfortunately, in reality, it's not like that. It takes a lot of blood, sweat and tears and a lot of time Things don't get solved in a one hour prime time slot, unfortunately. So how did I get into the world of digital forensics? Back in my day, I know I look 15, but uh, I've been working for about 17 years in this field. You didn't really, there was no courses to actually study. You either fell into it or got put into it. And for me, it was the latter. And for, my father doesn't even know this, but I have a lot to thank for, for him to actually get me into this field. I actually am an accountant by profession, but I don't really tell too many people that. Um, as I started my career, I started off in a small accounting, field, uh, accounting practice, and they were looking for an IT person also to help out with their networks. And I thought, I tinker around with computers a fair bit. I should be able to handle this. And as my career progressed, I got more interested in IT, but I also did the accounting profession, and it got me into 
one of the big four accounting firms. And we talk about opportunities. I had the opportunity to actually work in a, the first national digi digital forensic practice in Australia. They were starting up a brand new team. An email went out and I thought, that's for me. I had no clue what it actually was about, but it had the word digital and forensics, and I thought, that's pretty cool. So off I went, and I'll never look back. I think this is one of those points in, in my career where I thought, okay, this is where I actually have found my niche. Now, during those times, back in around year 2000, we'd go onto sites and collect data, go into premises, and you'd see stock standard machines, roughly the size of hard drives were 10 gig. You all are saying, I've got 10 gig in my pocket or on my phone. It was like 64 gig, 128 gig, 10 gig. And that would take us about, about five hours to actually collect because we don't just collect the files that are on the machine, we collect that deleted space because that's where all the good stuff is. Now, fast tracking that. Yesterday, I was in Beijing doing an on-site collection. We collected machines, again, very similar in situation, but most of the machines were one terabyte in size. Okay, so one terabyte, how long does that take? If you do the math, that would take days, right? With the technology nowadays and advancements in technology, it took about five hours to make a copy. So if you think about it with Moore's Law, it's true and true. Things are doubling each year. But going back to the year 2000, we had one of these. Now, this was the bee's knees in terms of forensic cameras. This allowed me to take a digital picture at 0.3 of a megapixel. That was huge at the time, okay? And I was able to transfer it onto a floppy disk. Okay, okay, I know, don't, don't get off your seats now. Now, being able to transfer it to a floppy disk, you're probably saying, why would you want to take a picture and put it onto a floppy disk? It's, it's so big. The importance for us from a forensic standpoint is that we were able to take those pictures, it go directly onto the floppy disk, and then put it into an evidence bag because part of our role is to make sure the integrity of the data is sound and no one can challenge the data we collect. So we have digital pictures put inside there. Another question you might be asking, what the heck is a floppy disk? Okay, Th that's a floppy disk, okay? For those who don't know, those uh, in that era who's still young enough or old enough. So, okay, now I appreciate floppy disks aren't around too much nowadays, for those who still don't know what a floppy disk is, I'm sure you've seen this cartoon about. So it's the save, it's a 3D version of a save icon. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so what better way to tell you about what I actually do than to go through a case study? So I've anonymized it a little bit, but I'll go through a case study that hopefully will give you sort of a day in the life of, of a consultant, a digital forensic consultant. So. I got a phone call one day, and one of our clients says, Davin, can you stop the internet in our company? And this was a tech company, so you're saying, you want to stop the internet. There's got to be something more to it than that. So after a long chat with uh, my client, they say, yes, we've received a letter from the government agency that says a certain IP address in our company has breached Certain, certain policies on their front. And what they wanted was that a fine was to be uh, submitted or a lawsuit, a, a lawsuit would ensue. Now, obviously, our client was happy to pay the fine. They realized what had happened, and they were happy to pay the fine. But they said, we want to find the bad apple. We don't want this to ever happen in our company again. I don't care what the cost is. So again, we were asked to help them out. Now, we had done a couple of other projects with this company, and part of the work that we do, as, we mentioned, as I mentioned before, is to be covert and to be discreet. So only two people in the organization knew what we were doing, the head of legal and the head of IT. And that's quite important in these types of discreet uh, matters because you don't want it to be leaked out into the public. Now, how did we approach this? We knew there was an IP address involved, and we knew the date range. So through logs, we were able to tell that five people had used this IP address previously in the company. So what we did was we ran stealth searches to allow us to search over the network 
via the network. So we didn't rock up to the person's desk and say, hey, can I uh, take your machine? We did it over the network, and after a few days, we had a hit. Now, I don't know about you guys, but things like that, they do excite me. <laughs> I was like a dog on a scent, okay? I was like, okay, time to acquire this machine remotely. We could acquire it over the network because we had full access, and we were able to start our in-depth analysis. So what does the in-depth analysis mean? It does not mean that I put a magnifying glass into the computer to look closer. What we were able to find through these searches was that what this particular machine had a hit against a log file, not just any log file, the McAfee virus scanning log file. Now, I didn't find any of the suspicious files that were in question actually on the machine at the time. But it was only against this log file, and the log file showed against a removable device, which again, we didn't have have uh, in our possession. We weren't able to acquire that. So we were like, what do we do? So this is how, this is just one of the forensic tools that, that is used out there to do this deeper analysis. We noticed that there were actually some virtual servers on the machine. So we were saying, okay, we need to dig a bit deeper. So these virtual servers, once we looked at it forensically, were actually hosting a torrent site. Okay, so if, if, if you know what torrent sites are, they're, they're a peer-to-peer -peer network to, to distribute uh, files. Now, this torrent website was, all, the users of this torrent website was internal, and it was predominantly the IT department. Now, for those who are in IT, no discrimination here, I'm just telling the facts. It was the IT department. Now, this was a big problem for the organization. Who did the two people I mentioned before that uh, this discrete was investigation was being conducted with? The head of IT and legal. So upper management started getting involved. They said, okay, something serious is going on here. Long story short, they dismissed the, the key individuals who started up this, uh, this, this site, uh, but it could have gotten a lot worse. The whole IT department was involved. There are about 30 staff members. So if the IT department goes down, the company could have also followed. So other types of work we've done before. Anonymous email death threats. So death threats are obviously to be taken very, in very high regard. These are very sensitive. We had to go and trace back and see where the email actually was, was sourced from. Another one, a fraud investigation, where our client actually had a matter where they wanted to trace back and find bank accounts, and these bank accounts we had no access to, we didn't even know their account names, but through emails on a mobile device, we were able to decrypt the attachments of them, and in the attachments had a bank account details, which ensued to many, many millions of dollars in fraudulent tra transactions. This one was a good one. So, a high net worth individual, I won't say what country they were in, he does all his art purchasing through a mobile phone, through SMS. And we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. So we get a call one day and saying, can you help out our client? He's deleted some messages from his phone accidentally, and he's about to sell this piece of artwork, and it could cost him about 20 million euros. So obviously, he wanted to spend a bit of time to try to dig that up. Now, in terms of what I do, I don't go around to parties and to friends' houses and say, can I have your mobile phone? Can I have your iPad? I just want to have a quick peek about it. But they won't give it to me. And, and as you'll see today, actually, a lot of these guys who do this type of work don't even have to ask your permission, to be honest. Um, but my parting thought is really, when you meet someone and they say that they're a digital forensic investigator, hopefully now you're not going to go, oh, you're the CSI guy, or even worse, can you fix my computer because my Wi-Fi is broken? We're not IT guys, okay? Hopefully, you'll be able to say something like, I've got a one terabyte drive. It's encrypted with 256 AES encryption. How are you going to decrypt it? And I bet you the response from the uh, digital forensic investigator will be, hmm, interesting. <laughs> Thanks for your time, guys.